Hello and welcome. This is my wife Mary and I'm Ed and we are Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. We are excited you're joining us today. We present or expound on a principle or belief related to the SDA Sabbath School Quarterly each week. This fourth quarter of 2018 deals with the topic of unity. A subject of supreme interest to the Seventh-day Adventist Church as schisms over ideologies and doctrines are abounding. This week's lesson deals with church organization and unity. We will start out with a quote in Sunday's lesson from Ellen White found in The Desire of Ages. She says, The church is built upon Christ as its foundation. It is to obey Christ as its head. It is not to depend upon man or be controlled by man. Many claim that a position of trust in the church gives them authority to dictate what other men shall believe and what they shall do. This claim God does not sanction. This is very pertinent counsel for today for sure. One of the problems we are finding in our church today, as mentioned in our intro, is schisms over ideologies and doctrines. As a church, we seem to be confused as to how to deal with people of differing ideologies and beliefs. So what should we do? Is a vote a good way to determine our doctrine? The pillars of our faith that Ellen White frequently speaks of are incontrovertible truths that give us a steady platform, a sure foundation to help us navigate the difficulties and perplexities of life. They are principles that help guide us to the right decisions and help us to overcome sin and be like Jesus and love others. These principles will serve us for all eternity. But how did the pioneers determine these sound doctrines? Well, Sunday's lesson is entitled Christ, the Head of the Church. Again, that sounds nice, but what does that mean? How is Christ the head of our church, as Ellen White tells us in the above opening quote from The Desire of Ages? For example, if the General Conference delegates vote against women's ordination, does that mean Jesus is against women's ordination? Does Jesus guide the church through the votes of the delegates? Ellen White said, We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. This is a popular quote from Ellen White. Notice it points out the one thing we as a church have to fear. That is, we forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. So let's go back to the pillars of our faith. How did God lead the pioneers? Through a living prophet, for starters. A prophet is the spokesperson for God. So I don't know how Jesus could head up the church in the present if he doesn't have a spokesperson for the Holy Spirit to work through. We all know that Ellen White received much instruction from heaven concerning our doctrines and church governance. Revelation 12, 17 and 19, 10 tells us that the remnant has the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. If you read the parallels in Revelation 19, 10 and Revelation 22, 9, you will see that the spirit of prophecy is manifested through a prophet. The spirit of prophecy is the Holy Spirit speaking through a living prophet. The Holy Spirit cannot speak to us in the present through a dead prophet. Of course, this does not downgrade the writings of the past prophets that are now dead, but we must realize that every Every church, even the Catholic Church, recognizes some of the dead prophets, especially after they're dead. This recognition of dead prophets would hardly be a good mark of distinction for the remnant church if all churches have dead prophets in common. Revelation 12, 17, 19, 10, and 22, 9 can only be referring to the Holy Spirit speaking through a living prophet. Now that would be a mark of distinction, especially when coupled with the keeping of the commandments of God. Think about this. What church on earth today can claim that they keep the commandments of God and have a living prophet? We are here to let you know you can have this today, this very day. There is a living prophet given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. A living prophet teaching to live the life of Christ, a selfless life, justification by faith. I've heard some people object to this idea that God needs a prophet in order to lead our church. They say things like, are you saying that the Holy Spirit does not lead me in my heart? I would then ask, are you saying that you have an experience with the Holy Spirit that would qualify you as the spokesperson for heaven, like Ellen White claimed? They, of course, would say no. Now, we are not saying that the Holy Spirit is not active in your life, but we would ask, was the Holy Spirit guiding the people in Ellen White's day while she was a prophet? How about in Paul's day? How about in Jeremiah's day? Of course, we would say yes. So you can see the guidance of the Holy Spirit in your own personal life has nothing to do with there being a prophet or spokesperson for God on earth. The gift of prophecy is a separate spiritual gift and a crucial one for the church. It is obvious our church today does not recognize the living spirit of prophecy. Our church is so split on various issues. Is the Spirit guiding each one of us in so many different directions? No. 
Some people claim that they are fulfilling the requirement for the spirit of prophecy in the remnant church spoken of in Revelation when they read and repeat the prophecies of the Bible to others. They say that by doing this, they are prophesying. I've heard this a number of times from Adventists as an answer to the problem of not having a living prophet in the remnant church. Well, if you are reading the prophecies of the Bible to others, why wouldn't you just call yourself a Bible teacher or an evangelist or a pastor, but a prophesier? I don't think people realize what a serious topic this is. Satan wants you to minimize the office of the prophet by getting you to believe the things that we just mentioned, that we all are led by the Holy Spirit so we don't need a living prophet anymore, or that by reading the Bible we are prophesying, so there is no need for an Ellen White or Apostle Paul type prophet anymore. The other tactic of Satan is to get us to believe that we should reject the idea altogether of a living prophet for fear of following a false prophet. Satan has connected the idea of living prophets with cults, but does the Bible promote the idea of living prophets? Yes, yes it does. In the introduction to Ellen White's book, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, Roswell Cottrell demonstrates the scriptural support for the doctrine of the church having and needing a living prophet until the return of Christ. Roswell Cottrell also points out that if Jesus said there were to be false prophets, then there was sure to be a true prophet, because if living prophets were not to be a part of the Holy Spirit's gifting to the church, Jesus would have said to beware of all prophets. We're not going to put these quotes on the screen for the sake of time, but we have posted them in previous videos many times. You can find Cottrell's writings, chosen by Ellen White herself, as the text that introduces her volumes of counsel specifically directed to the people of our church, the spiritual gifts. Specifically, it is in the Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, pages 5 through 16. You can also read this introduction in Early Writings, pages 133 to 143. This should demonstrate that having a living prophet is indeed the doctrine of truth promoted by the pioneers and the past prophets, not only from the Old and New Testaments, but from Ellen White herself. We need to do the experiment on this and search the scriptures to see if this is true. I have done this experiment, and you should too. I guess I don't understand why having a living prophet in our midst is such an upsetting idea. It seems like a great blessing to me. It is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit given to our church to help guide us and teach us how to think and learn and to make decisions and overcome sin. In what other ways did the Lord lead us in our past history? Well, not to leave out the writings of the past prophets like Ellen White and the Apostle Paul, we have the Law and the Testimony, which would include the writing of the present prophet as well. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. This is another scripture that was somewhat unclear to me before. Again, it sounds good, but what does it mean? How do we apply it to, say, determining whether women should be ordained or not? Well, first, let's define what the law and the testimony are. Trent Wilde, the present-day living prophet to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, explains it like this. The law is the teaching or instruction of God. The testimony is the report the prophets give of that teaching or instruction. The reason why we are to take things to the law and to the testimony is because they provide the most accurate filter and also the tools by which to evaluate material reality and claims concerning it. They are the instruments by which we can test the truth of an issue. The law and the testimony are an embodiment of knowledge concerning material reality, particularly moral realities. So let's take women's ordination, for example. Do you know that there has actually been direct teaching from the Holy Spirit to our church on this issue through the subsequent prophets after Ellen White? In addition to that, Ellen White herself gives us many great principles regarding women's ordination, as does the Bible. Here is an example of the law and the testimony at work through the instructions and teachings of God as reported through the prophets, past and present. The teachings of God through the prophets are what educate us in the ways of determining and then living by the truth and reality. They equip us with principles to land us on the truth. Past prophet Doug Mitchell has an entire study dedicated to this topic of women's ordination. In it, he shows that according to Genesis, both man and woman are made in God's image. Both of them were given equal dominion over the earth. Genesis 1.26. Even after the fall, man was never given any command to rule over woman. The curse that befell Eve has been misunderstood. Doug points out that Genesis 3.16 has been poorly translated into English. The phrase, thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee, should read, thou art turning unto thy husband. Doug demonstrates that all the most ancient translations prior to the Latin Vulgate in 382 A.D., 
correctly translate the word desire in Genesis 3.16 as turning or will turn. He then points out, with the help of the writings of Ellen White, God was not cursing Eve, but warning her now she would turn to her husband instead of to God because of her distrust in herself caused by her being deceived by the serpent. God was warning her of this new tendency in order to save her from the disappointment and failure that would ensue from this course she would tend to take. Before the fall and after the fall and always into eternity, God wants us, both women and men, to turn directly to him, not to any man or woman for that matter. Doug then answers the many common objections to women's ordination point by point. He uses reason and logic and reality, the law and the testimony, to demonstrate the truth of the matter. It is this process of applying the law and the testimony to each issue that will settle every matter in our minds and hearts. This and only this will bring unity. Some other quick highlights of Doug's study. On the topic of male headship and women speaking in church, Doug points out that Ellen White not only spoke in churches, but had headship over men while in church. Ellen White said this to a man that was about to open in prayer in a church. She said, But as I beheld him standing upright upon his feet while his lips were about to open in prayer to God, my soul was stirred within me to give him an open rebuke. Calling him by name, I said, Get down upon your knees. This is the proper position always. Men and women to this day still follow her directives to that man to get down on their knees when they pray to God. Doug also clearly proves that Paul was not saying that women should not speak in church in 1 Corinthians 14, 33-35, and actually shows that Paul was teaching the opposite, that women have every right in Christ to speak in church. He also points out that Ellen White was an apostle and a prophet, and as such held higher positions in the church than that of a pastor or an evangelist. See Ephesians 4.11 and 1 Corinthians 12.28. There are no gender restrictions mentioned in the giving of spiritual gifts by God to the church in Ephesians 4.11. If a woman was chosen by God to be the apostle and prophet, then why would a woman be disqualified for a lower-ranking position? It would be like saying a woman could be the president of the United States but not a senator. That same verse also points out that it is God who ordains women, not the men or women of the church. Also, Paul said in Galatians that there is no longer male nor female, but all are equal in Christ. Doug smartly deals with any inkling of gender discrimination in the church caused by not rightly dividing the word of truth. Again, the weight of scriptural, moral, and natural evidence is on the side of God ordaining women. The Hebrew word Torah, which is generally translated as law, is better translated as instruction. So the law and the testimony, again, the instructions of God given to us via the writings of the prophets, are to help us determine what the truth is, what is best. So what do we do when the General Conference rejects the living prophet of today? Do they have the authority to set doctrine in opposition to the law and the testimony? Is it good to vote on things like the doctrine of women's ordination, for example? The simple fact that they would even consider voting on a doctrine is proof that they do not believe in sola scriptura, or the law and the testimony, but they believe in voting to decide what is the truth for all of us. They vote on our policies and unique beliefs, and if a member happens to believe something different through the law and the testimony, they are frequently disfellowshipped. Through the law and the testimony, we can all come to the understanding of the truth. If we investigate new light, free from biases and preconceived ideas, with the single purpose of finding the truth of a matter, being willing to give up cherished beliefs if necessary, and then making the appropriate adjustments in our lives, we will soon be the purified church fit to give the loud cry to the world. To read the entirety of Doug's study entitled God Ordains Women, please go to our website www.bdsda.com and click on the banner featuring the study. Thank you for staying with us through the entire video. We invite you to visit our website www.bdsda.com to learn more about who we are and just as important who we are not. Please join us each week as we will continue to offer new and interesting insights for your Sabbath School studies. God bless. Many blessings.